Well, hello and welcome everybody. Uh, I would like to acknowledge that this event and uh, others across the states are being held on the traditional lands of a variety of proud Aboriginal tribes across the land that we call Australia. We pay our respects to Indigenous elders past, present and emerging. We recognise that sovereignty was never ceded and that it always was, always will be Aboriginal land. I encourage you in your events across Australia or overseas if you're joining us digitally to think about the lands you're on as well. Thank you. If I could take a moment now to introduce myself, I'm Sav Wolf. I'm the Manager of Operations and Diversity Lead for IGEA. I work across a number of different parts for IGEA. I work on a lot of stuff for GCAP and the Actors, and I run the Arcade with Kerry Hutton. The Arcade, for those of you who don't know, is where we're streaming out of today and was Australia's first bespoke games co-working space. I also co-chair the IGEA IDEA Working Group, IDEA standing for Inclusion, Diversity, Equality and Accessibility. Diversity isn't always an easy topic to face. We all have our own ideas we specialize in and want to focus on. The IDEA Working Group has been an amazing help to IGEA, pushing us forward to actionable ideas towards new resources that we can create for you and focusing us in directions we may not have thought of. We can't know everything that the industry needs right now, but what we do have is a dedicated team helping to steer us in the right direction. I'd like to extend a huge thank you towards the working group for their help and for the suggestion of this event. I would also like to thank Game Loft Brisbane, Games Plus Canberra and South Australia, and Ubisoft for hosting and sponsoring these events. In an ideal world, I'd be able to get the states together for one big celebration, but uh, COVID. Um, just as a heads up, we will have a question time towards the end, uh, starting at around 11 for Melbourne time. Uh, is there any questions you'd like to ask, please drop them in the Q&A function for Zoom, and I will be passing them on. Um, next, I would like to introduce today's guests. Uh, we have Ginny Maxwell, who is a writer for Screens Hub and Arts Hub, with a key focus for game development in Australia and New Zealand. They are also host of Acme's Women and Non-Binary Gamers Club, as well as a games critic for the Saturday paper. We also have Rashina Hoda, who is an Associate Professor of Software Engineering and Deputy Director of the Humanized Lab at Monash University. She is a leading international researcher on agile methods and grounded theory in software engineering. Her research focuses on the human and social aspects of social engineering, which she will explain a lot better than I ever will. Please give a warm <laughs> welcome to Rashina and Ginny. Thank you for that generous introduction, Sav. It's really great to be here um, and talking about gender diversity in STEM on uh, at this International Women's and Gender Diversity Day event. Um, the theme is Choose to Challenge, which Rashina and I both found a uh, exciting prompt, I think. Um, yeah, feeling very lucky to be here. Uh, Rashina, I've said this before, but it is so lovely to be in the same room with you. <laughs> same here. I think we'll have to watch out how much we get into our own little side conversations yeah. and just carry on. <laughs> um, I thought maybe uh, Sav did uh, give kind of a primer on your fucking impressive resume, but I wonder <laughs> if you'd like to go into a little bit more detail about um, kind of your background in, in STEM and what drew you to Agile as an area of research. Cool, thank you um, so much, Ginny. <laughs> I guess before I talk about how I got into the Agile space, um, I was thinking, really just trying to pinpoint how everything started for me, um, uh, right from getting attracted to STEM, so the science, technology, engineering, and maths idea. Um, and if I could pin it down to one thing, it would be my absolute love for physics. So that's kind of where it started in school. And I was just absolutely fascinated by the fact that things that we do in an, on an everyday basis, right? So you drop something can be actually put into a, um, an equation and it works universally throughout. That's just like blew my mind. Mm -hmm. So I was totally in love with physics, all the laws and yeah, very, very nerdy and <laughs> geeky um, to begin with. Now, soon after, so this was middle school. Physics is, uh, has always been part of the curriculum for most people that at least everyone gets introduced 
to science that way. Not so much for computer science, right? Now, I was lucky because I was growing up in India in a high school, and we were actually, um, in India, the digital curriculum was uh, introduced way, way back, right? Um, so obviously, it's looking a lot better now. But back when I was in school, I still had the opportunity to be introduced to something like computer science in year nine. And so uh, for people who are um, aware programmers or otherwise, the first language I got introduced to was basic. And again, the whole idea of things being analytical, things being something that uh, holds true in all contexts, no matter where you put it, um, things where you can abstract stuff out into um, you know, A plus B and so forth, which I know some people struggle with, but this was my thing. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed it. I, I liked the fact that you could abstract things out and, and work with them. So I got introduced to computer science in um, senior school, and then kind of just became my um, you know passion throughout. So with a bachelor's in computer science, um, and that was um, at Louisiana State University in the US. So you'll find out in the course of today, I've been a few places, I'm kind of a mixed bag. Mm -hmm. And if you're wondering wh where the accent comes from or the mixed up version of it, you'll figure out as I speak through where I've been <laughs> in all my life. So starting with India, there's a bit of the rolling of the R's from the US. And then um, I spent like uh, the last 15 years in New Zealand. Um, so. <laughs> Yeah, I won't speak to that. And then, <laughs> hey, it, it was voted one of the sexiest accents, okay? Uh, <laughs> and then now in Australia and since uh, 2019. So um, that's just geographic, but also the one thing that remained with me is my love for computer science and software engineering uh, throughout. So yeah, that's kind of how I got drawn into it, mm. I guess, to begin with. And um, and then the most recently, or, or the last, I say most recently, but it's the last 15 damn years. <laughs> um, I've been I've been studying agile software development, right? So um, people may have heard of things like Scrum, extreme programming, um, DSDM, Crystal, all of these kind of. Uh, so basically, how do you go about developing software? The process that the team follows to develop software. So that's what I study. It's so interesting to me to hear that your love of computer science from even the very earliest stages uh, was kind of uh, rooted in the relationship between the tangible and the real and kind of systems mm -hmm. and laws because um, in terms of your particular interest in agile, mm -hmm. it's very people focused, yep. right? That's Which true. is not something people uh, I think the general public would really associate with software development, particularly. Yeah, no, that's an excellent point, um, Ginny. So throughout the bachelor's, for example, I was introduced, obviously, like you do in a, a bachelor's of computer science to um, programming. But being in the US, actually, I did just about a little bit of everything from anthropology to economics to arts to so you got a taster for just about everything biology thankfully no chemistry sorry for <laughs> that was one thing i was like you know as soon as i um uh, enrolled they were like you can choose from two of three sciences and I was like, yes, <laughs> my day is made. Bye bye, chemistry. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry for all the chemistry lovers out there. But um, yeah, and then I was like, I'm going to be fine. <laughs> so uh, physics, biology, just about a little bit of everything, as I said. Um, but yeah, people. No one really talked about people when we were in the computer science class. It was all about, you know, um, well, abstractions and variables and arrays and lists and databases and SQL and Java and so, which was all great and I enjoyed that and there was nothing wrong with it. I could make it work. I was good at it. That helped. But when I came to New Zealand and I enrolled in my master's program, um, it was during one of those classes and this would have been 2005 um, that I got introduced to the idea of Agile. And the fact that it focuses so much on the humans in the process. And I was like, wait, just stop. All right, just take a step back. <laughs> We're still talking about this hugely technical idea of computer science. But we're going to be talking about the people in that process? 
that's pretty cool, right? So that's that's kind of where I got stuck to it. And the more I read about it, the, the principles, the values around people over process, um, you know, customer collaboration over negotiation of contracts and so forth, it all made sense. It was like, this is normal. This is how it should be, right? Um, and yeah, so then, as one does, and got brainwashed into a PhD. <laughs> um, and that for that, my topic became um, the idea of self-organizing teams. So um, Agile introduced the idea of empowered teams, right? So the managers, we don't need no stinking managers. We know what we're doing. And uh, we're self-organized. So, you know, who wants self-organization? We want. When do you want it now? What does it mean? <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's what I started to study, right? So what does self-organization really mean and how does it pan out in the real world? Um, so that became the topic of my PhD and then ever since I've been focusing on various different aspects of the humans in the process, whether it's the customer, the role of the manager, the role of the senior management, so all about the people in the process of software development. Yeah. Um, am I right in thinking there's a real uh, value in placed uh, on diversity of skills and diversity of experience in kind of the agile model as well? Yeah, so part of me as a researcher, I can't really tell you that there's a study that shows that agile is more balanced, <laughs> but my experience in the last, again, 15 years of being on uh, conference committees, on uh, being a, a speaker at events, um, and being part of teams that are organizing things, I can tell you that I see a lot more gender balance in teams that are agile, for example. Um, I think it makes for a really interesting research question. I don't know why that is, <laughs> but something about it that draws women, I think. Um, and, and just people who um, want to accept diversity are also almost also naturally drawn to agile, if that makes any sense. It's kind of a correlation. I, I'm not claiming causation, <laughs> and I cannot claim it with the research results yet because I haven't done a study on that or there isn't a study on that. But yeah, there seems to be a bit more balance of genders and other aspects in agile teams, particularly rather than in, in um, other traditional sort of uh, software development formats. Yeah. Um, in preparation for this panel, I was really interested in how Agile kind of could, like what Agile could do to promote or support diversity in the workplace. But something you raised mm -hmm. was the issue of diversity in Agile research <laughs> right. as well. Yeah. I wondered if you wanted to speak to that at all. Oh yeah, so this is more of an open question. I, again, I don't have an answer to this yet, but someone tweeted the other day about the fact that the Agile Manifesto, which is kind of where it all started, which lays down the four values of Agile, um, was written in a room full of middle-aged white men, <laughs> right? All of them. Um, I'm actually quite, you know, uh, in hindsight, I think it's really impressive how they managed to be so balanced <laughs> in, in what came out in the manifesto. But someone raised the question on Twitter saying, what would Agile look like if it was a more diverse group in that room that day? So that's an interesting one to ponder on. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, I don't think it's a huge problem per se with the way the values are already, even though it doesn't come from a diverse um, or seemingly diverse group of people. But yeah, that's what I was alluding to mm -hmm. with the diversity in research. Um, but again, going back to the um, research community, it's, it's actually quite diverse. It's um, you know across gender and um, age mm -hmm. and professional background and educational background and geographic in our case. So we've got like just this morning, I was um, um, with my program co-chair, uh, sending out rejection letters, sorry. <laughs> I'll be sending out acceptance letters this afternoon <laughs> for papers in a conference that we're co that we're co-organizing, and he's in Helsinki, so it was like ten for him in the night and seven a.m. for me, right? So we we diverse geographically, age, gender, backgrounds. That's just one example, but it's mm. it's quite diverse, yeah. Um, that was actually something we wanted to uh, kind of raise on the theme of choose to challenge mm -hmm. the idea of focusing. Uh, just on gender kind of diversity in this yeah. um, field and even the fact that gender diversity I think quite often is then winnowed down to just being women mm. um, 
and cis women specifically. Um, I wonder, and again, this is a very open question that I don't expect you to have like a perfect solution to, but I wonder how we can open these conversations up a little bit more to include things like geogra geographic uh, diversity, age diversity, yep. racial diversity. Yeah, um, that's a really good point, Jenny. Um, I think one of the things that I can point to that's a concrete effort in this direction is something we're doing in our humanized lab. So that's humans in software engineering lab at Monash. And the entire premise of the lab is focused on human centered issues in software engineering. So software is developed by people, it's developed for people. And the people that are developing it are diverse and the users on the other end are also diverse. So how do we take account of um, developing software in a way that it is um, accommodating a majority of the diversity that's in the user group. That's actually been studied for a long time. So for example, the human computer interaction space, the HCI community has been studying this for a very long time, trying to make sure that we are producing software that's accessible, for example, if we talk about differently abled people um, or you know, vision impaired and things like that. Um, so that's always been on the radar. We also have uh, tools like Gender Mag, and this is a newer research tool which allows software teams to identify personas that they're developing for and keep that in mind in terms of diverse, uh, diversity of the users when they're developing software and so forth. So the HCI software engineering community has kind of been working on that space for some time. But what's I think a little bit more um, sort of recent and really exciting is focusing inwards and being like, wait, the people actually developing it, well, they're also human <laughs> <laughs> and we have our biases and that kind of can easily creep into the software that we develop. And I guess it's been um, amplified by the more recent sort of anytime you have a case where you have a bias in artificial intelligence or something and that comes to the fore and then you're like oh wait what just happened <laughs> um, and that's when we become aware of these things but it's always been there right and it's getting worse because now we are having to train computers to think like humans and when we do that the biases that humans have get you know, transferred into how the algorithms work. And so for people who say, well, it's an algorithm, it's neutral, it's objective. Guess who wrote, you know, who wrote it? <laughs> There's somebody who wrote it and that's a person. And that it's important for that person to be aware of their own biases and, and where they come from. So yeah, long winded way <laughs> of um, coming to the fact that we have various now initiatives that are focused on um, looking at the human-centered issues in software engineering. So coming back to my humanized lab, you're looking at things like age, we're looking at gender, we're looking at personality. Something I'd love to look at, we haven't looked at yet, is neurodiversity, right? So things that are not made, you know, so easily visible, like, look at me, you know, tick box, <laughs> five different degen diverse categories straight away. <laughs> But neurodiversity is not that easy to spot. How do you deal with that? How do you accommodate for that in a room um, uh, to make sure everyone's included? Um, so that's another one. And um, yeah, so I'm quite excited. We're in a time and space right now where it is okay to have these conversations, where it's, it's encouraged to have these conversations. And no one's really been sort of, um, we don't need to have a villain in the story. <laughs> Right? It's okay, because we're all flawed in our own ways. And uh, we can still have those con conversations and try to make things better. Um, another kind of big question yep. uh, that we uh, will probably be pondering on for <laughs> some time, um, both within and outside yeah. of this panel. <laughs> um, so bringing this back to the workplace, mm -hmm. Uh, what do you, what steps do you feel that a workplace uh, can take to kind of become more inclusive in hiring and retaining yep. kind of a broader, like more diverse, yep. more diverse staff? Um, and if that is too broad, I would love to hear what, I would love to hear a personal perspective, what did help you or what 
you saw not working for other people. Cool. No, thanks for that. Um, I'll speak to, um, I guess, the general information I have, but also, as you said, some of my personal experiences in this area. So hiring people um, or diverse people, especially gender, I guess, um, and women in STEM, because that's kind of what we're talking about today. Um, with the hiring situation, I was doing up a little bit of reading, right? Because we need to know what the big big folks are doing. What What's Google doing about this? What's Facebook doing about this and so forth? So one of the things I came across was um, the Google Diversity Report in 2020. And they talk about a number of different steps that they have taken to improve the hiring situation. And a number of those steps I could also identify that I can see being taken in everyday institutions, including my own um, and my previous institutions. So I'll just speak to some of them and perhaps um, bring out if there are any stories that I, I can remember around those uh, particular initiatives. So one of them was to do with the um, language bias in um, adverts for positions, right? And there are tools these days, and. Um, You'll have to excuse me if I can't remember the uh, names of these. You can Google, Google it. <laughs> um, the tools that actually allow for any kind of an advert, um, hiring advert blurb that you write, you can put that into the tool and it will come out with you know data and stats on how biased it's looking or how likely it is to attract or not attract women um, to that position. One of the really interesting ones I saw, saw in the Google diversity report, Jenny, was, um, they said something like anything more than 54 words, mm. and they saw a dramatic decrease in the number of women applicants. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, wow. I, I was like, bizarre. But apparently, I mean, this is data that they've been um, sort of collecting for a really long time with real world adverts and real world applicants, obviously. So something that they've done recently is made sure that they're following those guidelines to not have the bias in the language of the advert and also make it short. And then they saw an 11% increase in women applicants, which is pretty amazing, right? So like, who would have thought? That's something uh, you would definitely want algorithms to be working on, things that we don't necessarily see um, or think of, like 54 words, right? That's so interesting. I was actually talking uh, about this with um, a friend of mine who's a software engineer about like, <laughs> Um, like red flag language mm -hmm. in uh, job adverts, stuff like, I don't know, like rock star, yeah, yeah. like rock star programmer or yeah. high you know, achiever. Yeah. <laughs> Aggressive. Work hard, play hard. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> she was like, <laughs> never. <laughs> That's right. So uh, companies, institutions and um, HR, if you still have an HR department, make sure they're now called people and culture or something more appropriate. Humans are not resources. <laughs> <laughs> I hate that term. Sorry, HR people. I know it's well-intentioned, but um, people in uh, HR or people in culture, as we now call it, um, are becoming more aware of these tools that are at hand to improve that uh, situation with the AdWords. The other thing, of course, is um, the actual panels that uh, perform the interviews. So there's um, unconscious bias training that the uh, people can go through. And I'm sure a lot of you are like just nodding around like, yeah, 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 knew that, knew that, knew that. <laughs> been, been there, done that, and that's all cool. But this is where I'll draw on a personal example. So we were sitting, um, as I'm often asked to be, <laughs> because we need diverse panels. <laughs> uh, so in a, in a hiring panel, and it was a position, I can't quite remember, the details of the position, but there were, for some reason, more women applicants in, in that pool. Uh, there were two women um, on the panel and um, a, a, a guy. And the women, uh, one more senior, one from mid-career like myself. And there was something that the other lady, and this is not at my current institution, and I will not name which place I saw this at. <laughs> um, and they mentioned something around the lines of, oh, this one. So there were some internal applicants as well, like, oh, I just random name, Sarah. Uh, she's about to go on maternity leave. Uh, that's not going to make sense for her to be applying for this position. And it was, you know, have you ever been in a position where you're like, 
wait, what did you just say? <laughs> that didn't just happen, right? And at the same time, the conversations moved on and you're like, damn it, I needed to have said something, right? This can't be happening. And then afterwards, the rest of them crossed with myself because I didn't say anything about it. Um, and But lesson learned, right? So next time I will. And it was bizarre because mm -hmm. there was a woman. And they were blocking out another woman for uh, the fact that they were going to be going on maternity leave. And that's just wrong on so many levels. I think that's um, something that is worth talking about as well. The way that uh, marginalization in workplaces or in industries can also breed a really unhealthy sense of competition, mm. I think, or a sense that, you know, well, I, I didn't, I focused on my career. I'm mm. not, I'm not applying for jobs and having babies or I'm like, I'm doing this, like I dress properly mm. kind of thing. I think, um, yeah, I don't know. I feel it's kind of goes to that balance we were talking about before the panel, which is maybe a rude thing to bring up on the panel <laughs> uh, between uh, making space and mm. and taking space yeah. as kind of a minoritized person in a workplace it's complicated it is it is very complicated because um on the one hand you feel extremely privileged and we were talking about this just to be even be in this position talking to you all today um it's been a series of very fortunate events that have actually taken us to this point where we can be here and be talking to you all. Whereas a number of other people, uh, if you look just demographically, could have been a replacement for me with the same demographic background mm. and would have never had this opportunity, right? So it's extremely, we're in an extremely privileged environment. At the same time, there's the other aspect of it, and um, there's a personal story here, Ginny. Uh, when I you know I like this <laughs> <laughs> story time um, is is one of my bosses once said when I, I was sort of new, and they said, uh, "Rashina, you're going to be asked to be on a whole lot of diversity things. I can tell you right now." Mm. And you have to watch out for becoming the poster girl for our department and make sure that you have enough time for yourself and the things that you're actually here to do, like, you know, research. Hello. Um, <laughs> so that stuck with me and mm. I did watch out for that, actually. So sometimes we because of that privilege, we also feel obliged to say yes to everything. Like, of course, it's my responsibility. Damn it. The universe has put me into this place. I have to, you know, really live up to it. And then there are some days you're like, I can't do it. <laughs> and it, you're human you're flawed and you know it's it's okay and sometimes you just say sorry not yeah, this one no. it's gonna have to pass i'm eating chips at home i'm busy <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> is, is that a real excuse <laughs> i mean i've used it more than once um yeah i think uh efforts to kind of diversify things like events hiring panels yeah. uh can sometimes inadvertently, um, and again, as we've been saying, there's no single, there's no bad guy out yeah. there. All of these things are done in good faith, mm -hmm. uh, I think, but um, they can just put an inordinate amount of pressure on, yeah, diverse, like yeah. diverse employees yeah. to be all things to all people. Yeah. Uh, rather than just letting them yeah. do their jobs. <laughs> that That's very true. And one of the things you definitely want to do in your teams and in your companies is make sure there's no one poster girl, <laughs> right? So have enough diversity in staff that the, even the responsibility of being on these diverse things mm -hmm. can just move around and they're all okay to share that responsibility and not feel like a mess if they can't make it once, right? Mm. <laughs> yeah. Um, this isn't something we talked about too much before, but I wondered if we could go back to talking about uh, just the benefits of diversity mm. as well, mm. um, because it's not just an obligation. It's an incredible benefit, I yeah. think, to workplaces. I uh, interviewed Lisey Kane at League of Geeks um, a little while ago, and she was talking to me about the fact they're hiring uh, in quite a few senior roles at the moment. And she was talking to me about the fact that they um, were essentially, the fact that she is lead producer there, mm -hmm. she's in a very senior role, actually made it 
much easier to attract uh, mm -hmm. candidates of the caliber they were looking for because more diverse people felt comfortable yeah, applying knowing role, role that she modeling, was yeah. leading kind of the process. Sure. Um, but yeah, I was wondering if you wanted to talk more about the benefits of diversity. Yeah. Um, that's, that's another double-edged one. Mm. <laughs> um, because on the one hand, why would you even need to talk about it? It is a diverse world, like just look around. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's it's on normal that we should have diverse workplaces and um, and bring those diverse perspectives to whatever it is that we do and we are passionate about. Um, but on the other hand, um, we still, you know, you may still have people who won't need to be convinced or at least shown some proof or data that actually is better. For example, to go through this effort of um, making things more diverse. Um, so, one of the benefits, of course, is the fact that, and I'll talk about software development in particular, or even game development. So, for example, if you are wanting to market your product to a wider range of people, right, then you need a minimum requisite variety within the team that's developing it to be able to represent to that wider set of people. Because, and I'll, I'll take one um, specific example. So this is from a time that I was, interestingly, and you may not have guessed, but I'm, I'm not a big gamer or uh, <laughs> game person in particular, but I like stories, right? And this, this translates itself in writing poems or short stories, or even being uh, a game designer on a project. Right or or a consultant or, uh, on a project. So we did one of the projects was around developing in dig digital worlds, and this was in New Zealand. And we had a team that actually put together because um, uh, I had you know really wanted to develop a serious game or an educational game to um, amplify in in that particular case the idea of critical literacy. Okay. So I went to this uh, professor in education and I'm like, hey, I've got this little pot of money that the Dragon Den people gave me. Um, would you like to be on our project? And I was like, okay. Mm -hmm. They're like, cool. And then I went to um, a game developer downtown. Uh, Stephen Knightley, if you're seeing me, hey, Stephen, <laughs> in New Zealand. Um, and he came on board and we had this team and we started developing, right? And it became apparent how the diversity in the team of the development team was starting to play out. So one of the things that they did was the um, artist on the um, team came up with a character that wore a hijab. <laughs> and the first time they showed it to me, like, oh, that's nice. <laughs> um, and they were also that person, the, the character in the play um, in the game was also uh, the chief scientist. But at the same time, they were they weren't pos you know they didn't have to be the sweetest person, <laughs> so uh, they had their quirks, and I loved it because it was so real, right? Um, and so when that game goes out to kids out there, and other girls, say for example, who wear hijab in this particular example, and there are a hundred other examples, see a character in a game that's wearing a hijab and is not, say, the damsel in distress, <laughs> and is actually the chief scientist, and also is not the, you know, they may, I mean, I would have loved a secret plot twist. It came out to be the evil person in the end. <laughs> Didn't happen. Um, but had some quirks, right? They were annoyed at something, or they can lose their temper, or something like that. It becomes real, right? And that's where you attract um, users, or even from an economic perspective, you attract a segment of the market that you had not access to yet because of that reason. So that diversity in the development team and the design team, ever so important. So that's just one example, but there's so many other benefits, right? And just the, obviously the big ones is uh, avoiding the bias for developing products that are obviously biased towards certain groups. Um, I don't know if people know about the colored color sensing soap dispensers that won't dispense to people from um, black ethnic backgrounds, racial backgrounds. <laughs> Have people heard of this? Some of people are going like, what the? <laughs> it's Maybe true. Maybe give it an introduction. Yeah, sure. So um, apparently, you know how we have got these um, automated soap dispensers, right? You put a hand under it, it dispenses soap. And it's on YouTube. You can check it out. And there are people, um, though, so black, I think it was in America, black Americans. It was the UK. I in the UK? Yeah. Right, thanks. Um, and they were testing it out. 
right? And it would not dispense soap. And the, finally, what they discovered was it was because they were looking, you know, it was the algorithms were looking for a certain color range to detect as human hand. Like, why would you choose color? <laughs> you had so many other sensors to go for. But it goes back to the development team, right? And it's not like they're malicious people sitting there, ha, ha, ha. Well, let's <laughs> wait till the black American, you know, uh, British person comes along and tries dispensing soap, we'll get him. <laughs> no, these are well intended. You know, the people, they're just doing their job. It's like because they never thought of it. It's because they never had a black person on the team to test it out. That's yeah. as simple as what it is, right? So, yeah. Totally. Benefits of diversity. I mean, yeah, why are we even talking about this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, same with the uh, Twitter cropping. Um, so Twitter uh, auto kind of uh, auto crops like particular images and then you click them to expand mm -hmm. if they're above a certain size uh, and it's trained to focus either on a face or on text but it prioritizes white faces over black faces and again the reason will be because the data set that that yeah. algorithm was given yeah. was light-skinned people pr yeah. like primarily or maybe exclusively, mm. but the effect is absolutely dehumanizing right. and awful. Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, if it's whether it's software products or it's games, um, we live in times where things that we do have reach literally across the globe. Right. In fact, that's what we aim for. That's what we'd like. But if you like to have products that are universally, you know, appealing and selling across like hotcakes in every market, it better be appealing and, you know, accommodating to the diversity of the universe out there. Right. Yeah. Aliens included. <laughs> um, maybe this is a good intro to the program you've been working with for the past couple of years mm -hmm. i think uh superstars of stem do you want to sure thanks you introduce that? yeah so um just just a quick correction just so you know um how much i'm already into this a month and a half actually oh. <laughs> wow slight correction sorry um it's because these these the program runs every um every other year and mm -hmm. it's a two-year program okay. so the cohort that i'm part of very luckily part of is uh starting 2021 mm -hmm. and we've just started to get things together this the superstars of stem <laughs> our little diary that we got so it's a professional development slash um role model building program run by science and technology australia so sta um, and it's focused on developing women to represent to be able to represent science technology engineering and math so stem across um, more generally in the general public media and so forth so just creating more role models to be out there talking about this and be seen because one of the things that um, drives driving the campaign is you can't be what you can't see. So um, to be role models to girls out there, you need to have women, as you said, um, um, you know, with the person you interviewed, um, mm. that, you know, it's, it was because of the fact that they were a role model in a position of influence mm. that attracted other women. So that's what the basic essence of the program is. And um, I'm super excited to be on it. It's um, <laughs> we have these training sessions and we have these workshops and we despite COVID, luckily, we managed to have one dinner for the <laughs> Melbourne cohort and it was amazing. Um, and just getting to see all these amazing women, there's an astronomer, there's an ophthalmologist, there are people in geosciences, there are, you know, all these different women with different passions around science and technology. And at different stages of their life, mm. um, some more confident about who they are, some a bit more questioning, uh, but we're all on this journey of uh, sort of uh, discovering ourselves, but also learning about, um, again, going back to that privilege mm. thing, the, um, the position that we're in to be able to influence things and make things better. So yeah, that's, that's the... Yeah. Um, in terms of training, uh, the kind of training and workshops that you're receiving through this program, uh, what kind of tools does it, is it hoping to provide you with? 
Yeah, so, so far what we've had is training around, say, confident communication and just, just kind of being yourself and being authentic, which is super easier when you've got people like yourself hosting an amazing audience <laughs> like this um, and not, you know, potentially sometimes it can be a bit more hostile. Mm. <laughs> so we do get training on um, media live interviews and rabbit holes that you don't want to go down <laughs> and what to do in that situation. Um, other things that we're looking at is just really building each other up mm. and being a support system for each other as well at the same time. Um, so that's kind of where I've got to so far. Oh, and we also worked on our elevator pitch. <laughs> Amazing. The full the full set. I love it. Um, in terms of, uh, and I think this goes back to something we were talking about earlier, but just on that note of uh, dealing with rabbit holes, you don't want to go down. Uh, we have kind of talked a little bit about the pros and cons of being like a visible mm -hmm. woman in STEM or a visible, you know, minority in STEM and how it can be a little bit totalizing, maybe mm -hmm. like that becomes rather than Rashina, the yeah. researcher, the yeah. researcher yeah. or you know, software engineer, uh, yeah, it can kind of dominate maybe the way people see you. And I wondered, as important as being a role model is, um, I wondered how, I wondered, I guess, if you have advice for other people who might be having kind of similar experiences of being the poster child or, mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah, in their workplace. and I'm sure you can bring in some <laughs> <laughs> stories into that to know yourself. Um, yeah, uh, I think that advice will be twofold. One to the, the role models mm. themselves is just be kind to yourself. You don't have to be perfect all the time. And uh, it's, you don't have to feel the weight of the universe on your shoulders all the time uh, because of the boxes that you tick, right? Mm. Um, because of, say, for example, my um, religious affiliation or the fact that I choose to wear a hijab or whatever, I am not representing every hijabi out there. I really am not. Um, and there are way better role models than I am out there <laughs> um, in, in, this, in the, that particular context. So I'm also a mom and I do not represent all moms in the world, <laughs> right? So that's, that's the thing that role models themselves need to realize is, um, is just being kind to yourself and um, being okay with not being the best or the most, the perfect mm. uh, self all the time. Um, and for people who are engaging with them, I guess it, it works both ways, is uh, seeing them for the people that they are. Um, so, I mean, one of the, I'll just take a simple example is one of the things that I say is, so people know about um, Ramadan is a month of fasting in Islam and mm -hmm. we fast from dawn to dusk and then we eat like there's no tomorrow <laughs> in the evening we eat quite a lot and then you know replenish yourself and then you do it the same thing again uh, and it goes on for a month right um so the first three days are killer like, oh wake up in the morning just the waking up because you gotta have the grub inside of you i mean i can't function for one i know some people just go you know go to sleep and just do the whole thing anyway so point there is um that teaches self-control yeah, and, and discipline. And um, I've, I've found that personally really beneficial because there will be situations where I'm, okay, mom to two teenagers, for example, <laughs> <laughs> self-control, <laughs> totally required. Uh, strange media interviews, <laughs> self-control, <laughs> totally required. And that helps. And then the parts of me that are not so nice, like the one time out of, I don't know, 50 that I do actually snap. Mm. That's me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So the bits, the parts of um, that I choose with, like whether it's my cultural upbringing or my educational background, those are the bits I like to think make me better. And the bits that I'm still working on are the bits that's me. <laughs> so if you see something that's a bit funny or weird or not so nice, it's me. <laughs> and I'm working on it. <laughs> yeah. But also letting yourself yeah have that yeah a bit yeah that realizing you are on a personal growth journey as well mm. and just being aware that well 
just working, keep working on it. You're working, we're all works in progress, right? Even the role models. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so we have two final things I want to talk mm -hmm. about, and I'm trying to figure out which one should go first. Um, maybe we can, we've talked a lot so, sorry about. Sorry to break, break mm? in, Jenny, but on that role model thing, mm. I, would you like to say something? Because you're in that position as well. <laughs> Uh, well, I will say, as a non-binary person doing an event on International Women's Day, it's something I think about a lot. This is the first International Women's Day event I've done uh, since kind of coming out publicly. And it was something, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's... Um, I think so long as I, know, I understand yep. that kind of in this, in this room mm -hmm. and in this position, like we said earlier, I hold a huge amount of privilege. Yep. Being here on like this side of the table, yep. enormous privilege. Yep. Um, and yeah, I think a lot about the fact that there are a huge range of gender diverse people who have less access mm -hmm. Um, less access, less of a platform, and I know that a non-binary person who looks like me is probably the most accepted in a space like this of all, um, yeah, of like all trans and non-binary people. And it is really important, I think, for me to both honour the fact that it's still mm. a bit stressful for me to be here, yeah. while also um, and I do feel a bit anxious about being mm. in this space, mm. while also knowing that I'm here to, it's, it's not about me. <laughs> it's because I do want to make sure that spaces like these become more accessible to a broader range yep. of people who are gender minorities yep. uh, in their workplace. Um, and I think I am in a position to do it. But yeah, yeah. it's a really, it's like a case by case. It's a tricky, yeah. it's just a tricky balance to strike, it you is, know? It is, it is. Very true. Very true. Um, thanks, for, thanks for sharing that. And I think it's difficult as well, um, trying to balance being, yeah, that role model thing of trying to balance being, I really value communication and I really value um, relationships and uh, understanding people. I'm not someone who likes conflict but I love debate and I love mm. conversation yep. um, and I think it's tricky to balance making sure you are open to people and their opinions and to talking mm. to them yep. without like uh, letting that just wear you down yep. Yep. <laughs> no totally agree totally agree yep yeah and that makes a so that's how I feel about that <laughs> <laughs> thanks for sharing um, but gender diversity, just as women in STEM can be a limited conversation, mm -hmm. gender diversity in STEM, I think, can be a limited conversation because, as you were saying, again, before the panel, gender diverse people should be, should feel able to go everywhere mm -hmm. <laughs> and do and work anywhere mm -hmm. so maybe the focus should be less on stem than steam right yeah so this was um when Ginny and i and our larger group was having a chat in preparation for the event and we were just voicing our ideas and thoughts and one of the things i said i would really love to choose you know the theme is to choose to challenge i would choose to challenge the fact that it doesn't have to be Super sorry, STEM, STEM, STEM. Why not STEAM? Why not put the arts in there, right? Why not? So there is, um, I mean, can you imagine game development without arts? Can you imagine? <laughs> it's just not, I mean, literally impossible to visualize because that's where the visualization came from, <laughs> um, the art side of things. So I guess as an ambassador of STEM, my take on this is anyone who wants to do STEM, anyone who is or can potentially be interested in doing STEM should have the opportunity to explore it. 
Now, whether they like it, love it, hate it, take it up, don't take it up, that's a separate issue, right? Whether they're attracted, they're like, nah, that's not for me, I'm, I'm going back to arts, and I know that's a big label, there's so many you know, varieties within that as well, um, that's fine. But to not have that opportunity, to be told you can't do this, to be told you should be taking English literature, for example, or <laughs> for that matter, you should be doing chemistry, right? That's not cool. Mm. That's the bit that I don't want to see. Um, and I, there's so many real world stories that I hear from people and I've experienced. Um, and my, I've, I've got two boys, so my, <laughs> and they know, they, they, we have these jokes around, um, they'll, purposely wind me up sometimes <laughs> and let the feminist come out. <laughs> but I know that um, uh, hopefully I'm, I'm giving them an upbringing where they learn to respect women and learn to respect people with all different types of um, uh, sort of references. And so um, coming back to that, um, the point, <laughs> which I can kind of digress sometimes, <laughs> um, get excited. Um, but it's, it's, it's about the choice, right? So choose to challenge is why just STEM? It can be STEAM, there's nothing wrong with it. But oftentimes what happens is you'll have, it's just like agile. So for the longest time, the focus, the real focus in technology was on the technology, the tools and the tech. And the people were almost forgotten. So when agile came around, the big revolutionary piece was people are more important than technology. So in sometimes when you're trying to set the balance, you tip the other way. And it can happen with the STEM situation as well, it can happen with gender, anything like that. And you tip the, ba uh, the balance and you go STEM, 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 and that's, that's great. But ultimately it's about opportunity and choice. So it can be STEAM where there's arts in there and it's perfectly fine to do that. And yeah. So that's what I, tr I mean, I, I'm not very good at it. I'm, I'm working on it, but mm -hmm. I love sketching, for example. I, I just like, that's, that's Sorry, what I Sorry, just love. got to interrupt there. You're very good at it. I <laughs> have seen I, I, I showed you my best work. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, sorry, I had a thought. Go it's through. interesting how I think something we have just kept revisiting because it, um, <clears throat> it kind of manifests in so many different ways, the way um, attempts to increase, <clears throat> sorry, attempts to increase access can inadvertently pro like apply pressure. Mm. Um, instead, I think definitely, you know, it is so important to, um, it's so important to provide programs for young people who might not uh, have a lot of access to STEM, um, particularly like gender diverse young people. Um, but you don't want the conversation just to be because it's so hard out there and you're gonna have a terrible time. <laughs> that sounds, yeah, that's very attractive, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, just I mean, just going back to the uh, role modeling thing um, and why it is indeed important to talk about women and being in STEM or just women in leadership positions and um, without any particular political affiliation, but say, for example, when a Kamala Harris swears in and you have these images of girls around the world stuck to the screen mm. being like, whoa, <laughs> you know, that is a possibility. Um, or I was particularly fascinated by I hope I'm getting the, her name right, Mimi Yuan, who is um, the project manager for the Mars uh, Perseverance rover. That interview wasn't about her being a woman in, mm. on that team. It was her just kicking some serious ass around. <laughs> you know, this is what the rover's doing. And, and that's representation right there. Enough said, right? You don't even have to highlight you're a woman or from a certain ethnic background. Just being there, that speaks so much right totally so yeah role models um and and that's why it's important because you don't want uh, a child sitting somewhere i don't know um in india or china or anywhere being told you can't be that person or you only have to be the person preparing the breakfast for the actual project mm. manager guy who sends her over to the no you can yeah. be the project manager <laughs> yeah yeah um uh, yeah i think there's a much bigger <laughs> 
of course, classic us. <laughs> There's a whole other rabbit hole I think we could go down about uh, the kinds of roles that uh, different kinds of people feel empowered to take mm. or feel, um, yeah, feel they are qualified for or well fit or well suited to. Thank you. <laughs> um, but I wonder, just because we have a couple of minutes left sure. and I think it's fascinating. We've talked a lot about how we can improve STEM and STEAM. Um, but you did a TED talk on Agile Nations, which is kind of maybe a bit more about how some principles from STEM can then improve the world. <laughs> yep, indeed. Cool. Oh, that rabbit hole. <laughs> right. Um, OK, so in my research, one of the theories that I developed, and this is theories not so much sitting in a lab dreaming up stuff. This is going out to the industry to study uh, how software development or agile software development is actually done. So I would interview people, I would observe teams and so forth. And from that, you build theories that are ground up, right? So evidence-based theories. And one of the theories that I published was around the idea of um, the theory of becoming agile. So how do teams actually become agile? What is that journey like? Um, and one of the hypotheses or the propositions from that theory is that both the team and the managers need to move towards this idea of agile. So if one's resisting, it's not going to happen. Um, and in particular, the idea of self-organization. So for the managers in the traditional sense to start to give up control a little bit, just trusting the team a bit more, and the teams then being actually able and ready to take on that level of empowerment and use that freedom uh, effectively. So that was in the software development context. Um, now, the Agile Nations idea kind of came around in 2019, and a little bit of trigger alert for people. Um, this was following the um, Christchurch mosque attacks. And while I was not personally involved or didn't have anyone that I knew was personally involved, um, it was one of those sort of really life-changing moments for me because as I was just telling you, Ginny, um, I think especially living in New Zealand um, for 15 years, I had this assumption, this huge assumption that I wasn't aware of. I was living in a bubble where nothing can go wrong here ever <laughs> and it was you know i used to joke with my relatives who are living around the world that the only thing that makes front page news is how the cat got stuck in the tree and it was beautiful because um that was the extent of the bad um it was gorgeous and and not to say um horrible things haven't happened in the past they have and to different communities um they have but this this was for me in my personal sense it kind of popped my bubble in a way um and in, in that time, I was, you know, being the abstract analytical person, just thinking, 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 worrying myself sick, just thinking. And what happened was a big collision of everything that I am from the professional to the personal to all aspects of my life just coming in this one big mush of an event, forcing me to think and make sense. So um, the silver lining for me in that was um, even though things like this unfortunately do happen almost on a regular basis in many other countries. Um, what set New Zealand apart was the response. And I was just, it was breathtaking. It was, I mean, I, I've always, I I've, I've love New Zealand. Um, <laughs> you gotta have some gut saying that in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> and I love Australia, and cause you know, global citizen, why not? Um, so, <laughs> The response was what set, us, set it apart. And in my process of trying to make sense of what has happened, I chose to focus on the positive, which was the response of the government and the people around me. And that, to me, was the most agile response I'd ever seen to something outside of software engineering. So it was human-centered. It was empathetic. It was rational. It was, you know, uh, people over the process. It was, um, um, yeah, go see the talk. <laughs> I, I do summarize uh, and, and 
as best I could uh, my feelings at that time around, it was basically my way of saying thank you um, <laughs> to New Zealand for what they've done for the Muslim community. Um, so that is the idea of taking something that's super technical in a software development context and applying it to the wider societal context saying, here are the principles from Agile. Can we actually use that? Um, and, and we use Agile principles to deal with a VUCA business world, right? So volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous business world. Can we use as those concepts to deal with a VUCA real world, right? So this was VUCA real world amplified, exemplified, right? And 2019 and 2020, again, people are reaching out to me to talk about it because this is, again, um, relevant now in the context of uh, dealing with COVID, for example. And you can see countries that where the management, so in my original theory, so the managers and the teams, which are the tribes, the people, they're all following the rule. They're all on the same path. They're all committed 100% to making this better. Those are the countries that have actually done well. Those are the agile nations that have, uh, you know, and we, we're one of them, uh, especially for our relative size. It's amazing how well we've done. Just continue that way. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and being able to have this conversation right now yeah. without masks, meter distance. I know. Um, uh, it's amazing. And that's because we've been one of the agile nations. It does yeah. feel kind of unbelievable, like, <laughs> being here. Yeah. Um, we had backup plans. <laughs> Thankfully, we didn't reason. need to, yeah. Um, so I have some questions coming through from the stream. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we're also very happy to take questions from the audience as well. Um, if you just want to like give us a wave. Um, if you're up the back and I haven't called on you, give us a bigger wave. Because <laughs> um, I'll try to get to everyone in the half hour we have. Um, I wish we had more time to talk about Agile Nations because you clearly know enough about it to literally fill a TED talk. <laughs> um, but if you do have more questions on that concept, absolutely uh, ask us a question. Um, the first question we have from the stream is, the comment Rashina made about not having to have a villain in the piece and that we're all flawed, what advice would the panel have for promoting a culture of correction within the workplace? Cool, that's such a good question. I'm so glad someone picked up on the villain. <laughs> oh, I want to talk about the villain in the story. Um, so what's their name? I don't have a name okay, there, sorry. sorry. <laughs> My lovely person out there who asked this question. Um, I do want to talk about the villain in the story because, and this translates to just about everything that I see has come through as a revolution. So even with Agile, when Agile was launched, Guess who the villain was? Waterfall. Waterfall was the villain. Villain. We used to like as a as a lecturer, for some time at least unknowingly, I would introduce agile as a, um, you know, in comparison to waterfall, saying is everything paused wrong that can possibly go wrong in a software development team is because of. But you know why? What? It's one of it's the longest running software development methodologies. It's done us okay. <laughs> we are all, you know, as a community on a you know a pathway of improvement. So agile is that next milestone in that improvement, and that's fine. That doesn't mean the waterfall needs to be the villain in the story, right? Now, similarly, for when we talk about gender diversity in particular, I feel so bad. <laughs> I feel gutted for the demographic that is the middle-aged white man. <laughs> I am so sorry. I am so sorry for all those conversations out there that make you the villain, because you're not. You're not. In fact, some of the biggest allies and some of the biggest mentors I've had in my life, right, have been the middle-aged white men, right? And with Say, for example, Emma Watson in her UN speech on the He for She campaign. That's a classic example. We need this to be a conversation about 100% of the people, not a 50% of the people. So we don't need a villain in the story. We don't have to have a villain in the story. It serves a purpose to say, all right, that's because it's the majority demographic or privilege or whatever. But 
hats off to people who still have gender conversations while you're in that villain demographic. I mean, you're amazing. Uh, sorry, just put up with it while we get better at having these conversations. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I've got another question from the stream. Sev, would you remind? Oh, would you mind? Uh, putting names in as well just so i know who we're addressing okay. um, if people are comfortable then yeah, yeah no worries <laughs> so the next one is from jack uh, and the question is within an agile environment what challenges have you seen diverse people face as scrum masters and experienced coaches Ooh. how do these challenges differ from a traditionally organized team wow that's an excellent question jack um i just off the back of my head right now, I can't remember a Scrum master story, but I can tell you a product owner story. <laughs> so product owners, for those who are, may not be familiar, um, are the rough equivalent of a customer in a software development um, context. So you're the person who's meant to be providing the um, big picture vision of the product and uh, providing the requirements on an iterative basis that the team then develops. So. I was in a meeting once as a, um, well, I was almost about to say innocent bystander, <laughs> a researcher, okay, fly <laughs> on the wall, we often talk about, right? So we're just kind of sitting in the corner observing, we're not really commenting or judging or anything like that, just observing the sheer brilliance that is practitioners in action, right? So there was the product owner and it was a woman and the rest of the team were guys. And it was funny because no one was really addressing it, but for me, from an observer's perspective, I could see the gender issue play out because that person as a customer had that position of authority in that situation where, well, of course, it's a paying customer, customer's always right kind of situation, but you could see the tensions playing out and I was, it did make me wonder if it would have been different how the team was reacting to, and, and this was an angry customer. <laughs> So she wasn't happy. Um, in that particular situation, the team hadn't delivered what they what she'd been asking for for a couple or even more iterations. So it was delayed. Um, and of course, she was a bit upset, right? But I could see a little bit of hints of gender playing out. And I wondered if it would have been different the way the team was reacting to the product owner had that not been a woman. Um, and would they be more receptive or even apologetic uh, if it wasn't a woman? And you know, but yeah, you get stereotyped a lot, like, you know. Um, so that's one that I can think of. And in general, Scrum Masters, there are some amazing women Scrum Masters and men uh, Scrum Masters that I've seen. I can't really think of a particular line that I would draw on gender lines mm. in, in that space, but the product owner, for some reason, I think it's the power distance with the team that starts to play out. Because with a scrum master, if you're doing it right, um, it's not really meant to have a lot of hierarchy, right? So it's it's cool. You're like one of, with the team in, in many ways. But the product owner is a little bit of a power distance situation and the gender starts to play out, I've seen. Yeah. Um, and do you think, uh, how do you think that differs, yeah, with traditionally organized team or? Um, interesting. So I've had the opportunity to work in the industry for a very short time. Mm -hmm. And in that time, we had um, we had no sense of what Agile was at that time. So this was 2004, Agile was very new. Uh, this was in India, I was fresh out of my bachelor's and I was really just itching to code, essentially. <laughs> I wanna you know, practice what I've been taught for all these years. So um, the default, I would say, was kind of traditional um the process and we had um managers who were women in that position and if i remember correctly there was actually quite a lot of respect and just um um acceptance of authority so that's an interesting one i think if mm. we tease it out it might also come down to the fact that agile empowers the team to question the managers more and that's where the gender might actually start to play out whereas traditional may not even, you know, the hierarchies are just assumed and accepted, potentially, and gender might just become a part of that equation and not play out as much. Mm. Is that making sense? Do you see what I'm trying to <laughs> get at? So if you don't question authority, the secondary questioning of the gender doesn't arise. 
But if we question authority, then the gender issue might play up even more. Mm. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Do we have any questions in the room? Yep. Yes. Yeah, sorry, I missed that bit on. Did you say uh, startup? Yeah, startups or foundations of organizations rather yep. than through expansions. Right, cool. Um, it's really difficult to differentiate that from the Agile because um, Agile started with small teams, right? So it's very, that is the sweet spot for Agile is, is the startup kind of culture. Lean is really great for startups because, again, the flat hierarchy situation. Um, and in terms of diversity, I find the whole um, agile community, especially the smaller ones, I would suppose, a lot more open to trying out new things. That experimentation mode, all of this, those things kind of tend to go together. So I guess what I would think is common as a theme that allows this to happen is openness, right? So you're open to experience. So you're open to trying out a new way of working agile, you're open to having diverse people speak their opinions during, say, um, design um, and um, in the actual development and when you're demoing your product and so forth. When you scale, some of the challenges that come with scaling is structure. And that it's again, it's not one of those things people sit down and decide maliciously to make it more complicated. It just kind of happens because of the sheer inertia of size. Um, so one of the biggest companies that I've um, actually had the pleasure to observe was Volvo Cars in Sweden. And it's almost like an island on its own. <laughs> and um, you, you go up there and the sheer size of the thing hits you. So you would have cubicles, numbered cubicles, like it's like a city in there. To try and find somebody is, is amazing. And to see how diversity might play out in there, I think when you get to a particular size, it's probably better done top down. So what I mean by that is when you get to a particular size, there are niche pockets of culture within the team. So your team might be very agile and might be very open to diversity. And at the top level, if it's still very traditional, and uh, the uh, sort of, I, I like to think of the C-suite and the senior managers as sort of the custodians of the culture in some ways, um, or at least the practical policy side making side of things. Um, it's, it's when these, the conversations start changing here that it trickles through throughout. And we see that with diversity, we see that with Agile. Agile started with um, being a developer's revolution, bottom up. Um, I had some of my uh, very, very um, uh, close friends in industry make a living out of trying to convince senior management to do Agile. And look where we are uh, 15, 18 years down the line. <laughs> You've got senior managers going, yep. We're going Agile tomorrow. <laughs> Better train up. And the developers are like, we don't want this anymore. <laughs> it's not cool anymore because you want it. <laughs> it was cool when we wanted it. Uh, the same for diversity, right? If you make it into this thing that everyone has to do, it's not cool anymore. So when the, you know, talking about the scale and size, small um, organizations, startups, it's not about policy, it's about the norms. When you go to a large organization, you have to have policies. And it's the way the policies are doled out and socialized. If it's still made uh, you know, attractive, it's made cool, it'll be fine. If it's made into a mandate, we don't want nothing to do with it. Yeah. Does that kind of answer your question? Cool. Uh, are there any other questions in the room so far? Yep. Yes. Yeah, um, I guess you know, coming from a small business, business perspective, um, and on the business, 
just in front. Uh, you know, if I had to walk away from the team today and you know, reevaluate and look at our progressive in our company, you know, where would you recommend that I make that start in that journey? Do you have to Wow, that's such a cool question. Do you mind if I just question. repeat? Oh, do you want oh, yeah, to repeat yeah, no, the question for, for the stream? Oh, yeah. So um, as a small company, you said, and you're wanting to go back and um, reevaluate and uh, potentially s start looking into ways you can improve diversity? Yeah, yeah, sure. I think there will be... Um, strategies that you can put into place but even before that happens i guess awareness and conversation right um so on a pretext of i don't know everyone's looking for an excuse to get together these days right like face to face <laughs> <laughs> for a coffee or some kind of an event um and you get together and make that a topic and it's going to be uncomfortable it almost always is um so maybe not the first event <laughs> but have that chat and um, one of the ways uh, I can suggest that I've seen work for a little bit more controversial topics is the unconference style, right? So you don't have a particular agenda, but you have a theme. And then you can say, all right, we're going to um, um, or open space, as, as it's called. And so you can have people say, all right, we're going to be talking about diversity and especially about how we approach it in our organization. Who wants to maybe just start a conversation? You don't have to be, uh, be the one with all the answers, but who wants to start a conversation about the challenges? Who wants to start the conversation about strategies? Who wants to start a conversation about where we're at right now and where we want to go? And then literally, quite literally, on the four corners of an office, uh, you can have spaces for everyone wants to talk about strategy, you know, and then you just talk. And uh, depending on the culture in your organization and how long you've been working together, <laughs> it can be really interesting conversations. But I think that's the starting point, just opening it up. Um, and the other thing that I've noticed that I'll uh, bring in um, Janine in this, into mm -hmm. this conversation is when we do this um, in the university, for example, we have such a nice culture of sort of psychological safety so that even if you're not sold on the topic, you're comfortable to say you're not sold on the topic. And then someone will tell you why it's a good idea, right? But if you have a culture where it, it's either one, one or the other way, mm. where you just can't talk about it, or the other, other one is, oh, no, no, it's all good, and it's all, you know, um, um, I don't know, happiness and uh, sugar and mm. <laughs> sweet coating it, right? Diversity isn't easy. It's challenging. It just doesn't naturally happen. You don't just chuck a bunch of diverse people in a room and magic happens. <laughs> I think um, I think that uh, idea of just being okay with feeling uncomfortable and not knowing what to do yeah. is actually like an incredibly, like you said, yeah. like just an incredibly healthy place to start because yeah. it gives your, it means that people who have, you know, diverse people in your workplace who have ideas or who are having problems are going to feel like they have more, uh, I guess, uh, right or ability to kind mm. of raise those problems yeah. without feeling like they are the problem. Yes, um, that's very if you well get, put. Mm. If I think if your first response is like, well, I didn't mean to, or mm -hmm. um, well, how do we, how do we fix this right now? Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let's yeah. just fix yeah. all of the problems today in this 45 minute meeting yeah i think it can be kind of overwhelming yeah so i think just the idea of like yeah listening yeah yeah <laughs> just yeah. listening that's that's the starting point and then of course there are a bunch of you know um ideas around uh as i mentioned some of the things around um uh advertisements and um, unconscious bias training and uh, having a diverse panel on the interviews and that's the uh, sort of hiring part but then there's a whole piece around retention and inclusion so it's a long journey, but to start <laughs> off, just opening up that space to have those conversations. Yeah. Cool. Um, Could I take have one a, question yeah. in the room and then a couple from the stream? Cool. But yeah, go ahead. Yes, yeah, please. Someone touched on it, but uh, in this idea of focusing on creating a studio or a company or a team that's more diverse, what would you recommend some of the main things to do before 
or we get those kind of guys people to talk about these conflicts than an actual, you know, trail where you have people from different backgrounds and different opinions. Yep. What would you recommend as like the first step before breaking all those people so to ease that process and reduce conflict? No, that's that's a very good question. Um, Just to repeat yep. for the stream. Oh, yes, thank you. Oh. <laughs> um, the question is, when you are running a studio, what steps can you take uh, basically before um, kind of introducing more diverse hires to make sure it's kind of, I guess, a culturally safe or generally safe space yep. for them? And also tying in the fact that diversity isn't easy um, and there are challenges that come with it. Um, for sure. So, um, give me a second. I had a thought there. <laughs> um, right. So, Bruce Tuckman's norming, forming, storming, performing sort of journey of becoming a team. That is still valid. You know, this is the relevant most parts these days for a group of people to come together. It's a group of people, right? To come together to become a team that is then productive and functional. Yes. And it goes through those more or less the similar kind of uh, stages of trying to understand each other and then you're going to disagree and then you're going to find some norms and then finally start performing. Yeah. Um, I wonder about bringing diversity into that model. Right, because that's going to throw in a whole bunch of new challenges around the storming, for example. And I was even thinking in the IGA context mm. um, for game developers. I've had uh, students develop games, um, of, you know, in the university context, and I know people. And and in my own experience, we can get stuck up on these design decisions, right? and even character design or any small element of it and you can be on debating on and on for hours and that's not very productive at the end of it i mean to a point that is um and you bring diversity into that picture right and it makes it even more complicated so a understanding that it's going to be challenging and the team is going to go through that process of storming and then norming and then start to performing uh start, start to perform and how diversity is going to play into that. So how what can you do beforehand? Um, I think one of the things that you can do is, is going back to the previous question here from the gentleman around preparing the space in terms of being just open to that conversation first. So before you introduce, maybe this is not the best analogy, but say, for example, you're introducing an, a new pet hmm. to your group of pets. You got to first care about the ones you have, <laughs> right? Before kind of bringing in the new one, and then care about them too, and then care about the fact that they get to get along together. So I guess your question in many ways is that caring about the ones we have. So making it okay and understanding where they stand on that issue first, and what pace are they comfortable with when we start to go into this journey. Um, and what can they bring to it? Maybe they've already thought about stuff. Maybe they have a friend that they thought would never fit in. But you know, what's the culture add? Do they think about preserving the culture in terms of culture fit? Or are they open to a culture add kind of situation where bringing in someone that's very different to them? So just preparing the ground in terms of taking care of the people you have, creating that psychologically safe environment in which to introduce more diversity, mm. the pace of it, uh, the strategies we are going to do. And then also not just talk about, I guess, in, enable them and empower them with actual uh, tools and techniques. So unconscious bias training can be an eye opener for many people. Mm. Um, and, and the other things that we talked about today. So again, yeah. Would, would you add something to that? No, I think that's a really good answer. Mm. I think it's a really good answer. Um, I have a bit of a spicy one Ooh. from Justin on the stream. Uh, Rashina, you mentioned agile project management. Are there any project management methods that are not supportive to diversity? Are there, are any we should avoid? Thank you. Oh, wow. Um, I think um, in terms of project management, especially for software or game development, um, any kind of a technical endeavor, I don't think any of the designers of these methods, whether it's waterfall or the rational unified process or spiral or um, the agile unified process, any of those were actually 
had diversity in mind to be honest <laughs> so it's it's really if if any of the methods do have principles or practices within them that may inadvertently discourage diversity it would actually be just inadvertently mm. um but just on the top of my head doing a sort of mental scroll through some of the models that i know about um and that i just kind of mentioned also i think there's room in diversity for each of them mm. it's not as if agile is um it may be particularly suited i think because of the empowerment concept right but um there's no reason why you can't have diversity in waterfall right there's uh, no <laughs> even waterfall <laughs> the villain <laughs> um um yeah i think it's 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 an intermingled but kind of separate conversation it's um no matter what process that you're following diversity can be built into it so i mean again going back to say game design uh in terms of uh, designing characters or worlds or uh, so uh, the artists working with the designers working with the visionaries and so forth um you have you can build in diversity through that mm. so if you had diversity as a lens it could apply to just about any project management framework i'd imagine yeah uh i think sab is going to play us off now <laughs> <laughs> thank you um sorry to have to cut them off as i'm pretty sure we could listen to the two of you all day <laughs> and i i know i could at this point um i just wanted to say a huge thank you to the both of you as well um for offering your time your insights and your knowledge today um you've both been absolutely incredible hosts and thank you for this opportunity to hear from you both um so could i grab a round of applause for them thank you <laughs> Um, I would also like to thank all of our sponsors and hosts again. Uh, thank you to Gamesloft Brisbane, Game Plus Canberra and South Australia, and Ubisoft. Uh, we couldn't have done this one without you, and I hope the stream quality has held true for you, and the catering has arrived on time. I know mine has, I just got a picture of it. Um, thank you again to the Ideal Working Group for your suggestion and help with this event. Um, before we close out, I do have a few things I would like to mention. Uh, the Women's Leadership Awards are now open for nominations. Uh, it would be really great to see some games and games adjacent women nominated for the tech and STEM ones. Uh, if you've got some women in your company or your life that you would like to see recognized for their work, you can find the link to nominations at womensleadershipawards.com.au. Alternatively, I will be sending out an email link to all attendees after this event. Um, I mentioned earlier in my uh, you know, at the start of the stream, that diversity really isn't an easy topic to face. Uh, you don't know what you don't know, and sometimes we find it hard to ask questions about it, and even harder to find our answers. For our next project at IGEA, um, for the IDEA Working Group, we wanted to work on helping you as an industry find the courage to tell us, I don't know. Uh, we have created a form for you to fill out. It's only two questions, so don't worry too much. Uh, for you to ask the questions of us about diversity, equality, inclusion, and accessibility that you would like to know the answers for, so we can create what I'm hoping to call the IDK pack. Uh, because like I said earlier, we can't know everything that's going on in our industry, and we don't know what the industry needs right now at all times. And if there are consistent knowledge gaps, we want to help out with that as much as we can. I'll email the link to the form uh, for all attendees, and I would love to hear some of your questions, so please get in contact. Um, as I close out today and leave you all to your nibbles and chats, I want you to think on today's theme. Diversity and inclusion can and should be a challenge for us. It's uncomfortable, it's sometimes messy, and we do get it wrong sometimes. But that shouldn't stop us pressing forward to do better and be better. Think about what choosing to challenge means for you. Does it mean challenging the status quo? challenging the gender biases of our industry, challenging your idea and approach towards gender diversity and inclusion. We all have a champion inside of us, ready to challenge the day and move towards a better future. It's all about taking that step forward. If it's your first step, fantastic. If it's your 400th, incredible. But it's all about moving forward. So please think about what your next step is going to be. Thank you again and have a great rest of your Friday.